an enemy of intrigue far removed from any scheming or from the parties that have divided a France shaken by passion, I have cleared a new path for myself. I have observed through my eyes alone. I have served my country only according to my lights. I have denied the foolish. I have censored the wicked. And I have sacrificed my entire fortune to the revolution. What motive has driven away the men who implicated me in criminal affair? Hatred and fraud. Matter sensible, I have never ceased to work for the good of my country. She has been called one of the first feminists ever and continues to create long-lasting effects hundreds of years after her death. Her views of slavery would bring the issue from the sidelines to the bloody trenches and front lines of French society. Her visions of the independent woman and her desire and determination to see it through would cause a tsunami of changes, making the idea of a modern woman possible in a day and age when society was dominated by man. Marie Gouche, more commonly known as Olympe de Gouche or Madame de Gouche, a feminist abolitionist and political activist during the French Revolution, changed the political field with her pamphlets, plays, and other writings that challenged what it was to be a woman during the 18th century. In doing so, she took a stand against the Committee of Public Safety, society's views of women at the time, and for women's rights and other important issues such as slavery. As a young woman, de Gouche moved to Paris to become a writer. The law at that time stated that a woman must gain approval from her husband before being able to publish anything, but as both de Gouche's husband and father were dead, she was free to publish whatever she wanted, and what she wanted would change the world forever. De Gouche's revolutionary feminist views centered around getting women basic rights, the right to property, equality in the eyes of the law, and freedom of speech. Under these basic principles, she dedicated her life to see justice. Her idea of the right to property entailed two main parts, the right to own property and the right to not be property. This meant that not only should a woman have the ability to be her own person, but also should be able to get the means to live her own life. If one of the couple were to die childless, the other would inherit by rights unless the deceased had disposed of half of their common assets in favor of another deemed appropriate by the deceased. De Gouge wrote in the sample social contract between man and woman in her most famous work, Le Droit de la Femme, suggesting that if a married person were to die, their assets would go to the widow or widower, regardless of gender, unless otherwise specified in their will, in which case the former spouse were to still get half of their wealth, a practice now thought of as obvious regardless of gender, but was not even thought of not too long before De Gouge. She also wrote... Property belongs to both sexes, united or separated, for it is each an inviolable and sacred right. No one can be deprived of a true natural heritage unless a general necessity, legally verified, obviously requires it, and on condition of a fair indemnity agreed in advance. Expressing that a woman should be able to own her own property in the same document. In addition, de Gouge joined the Society of Republican and Revolutionary Women to help raise money for young girls' dowries so that they would have more freedom to marry whomever they chose and openly oppose the practice of sending young unmarried women to convents, a practice that was common at the time. The right to equality in the eyes of the law means that women have the right to be taxed, represented, and prosecuted as an equal. This meant not only that a man should be fa not be favored over a woman in court, but also that a woman should not be favored over a man and should be held fully accountable for actions. As she said in Article 15 of Le Droit de la Femme, The collective of women, joined to that of men for the purpose of taxation, has the right to demand of any public agent on account of its administration. The freedom of speech, arguably the field in which de Gouge had the most effect, included the belief that women are necessary to the success and betterment of society and of humanity. In the preamble of Le Droit de la Femme, de Gouge states, Mothers, daughters, sisters, female representatives of the nation ask to be constituted as a national assembly. Considering that ignorance, neglect, or contempt for the rights of women are the sole causes of public misfortunes and governmental corruption, they have resolved to set forth in solemn declaration the natural, inalienable, and sacred rights of women, so that by being constantly present to all the members of the social body, this declaration may always remind them of their rights and duties, so that by being liable at every moment to comparison with the aim of any and all political institutions, the acts of women's and men's powers may be the more fully respected, and so that, that by being founded henceforth on simple and inconstitutable principles, the demands of citizeness may always tend towards maintaining the constitution, good morale, and the general welfare. In consequence, the sex that is superior in beauty as in courage, needed in maternal sufferings, recognizes and declares in the presence and under the auspices of the supreme being the following rights of the woman and citizeness.
And in many ways, Deguchi was correct. She was one of the first to question the use of the word man when referring to people in general. She has been praised as the person who brought the issue of slavery to the French table with her writings such as Le Asclage de Noir or Hux Naufrage, a play written from the perspective of slaves, which although it was taken off the stage after only three performances had already made a difference. Women's freedom of speech also included the right to be equal to man politically, or that they must be able to contribute equally to the formation, continuation, and devolving of the governmental body, as she states in the sixth article of Le Droit de la Femme. The law should be the expression of the general will. All citizens and citizens should take part in person or by their representatives in its formation. It must be the same for everyone. All citizenesses and citizens, being equal in its eyes, should be equally admissible to all public dignities, offices, and employments according to their ability, and with no other distinction than that of their virtues and talents. Many men saw her as someone who was trying to be someone she was not and could never be, or even someone who was insane. After her death, a man named John Johnson Lewis even went as far as to say... Olympdegouche, born with an exalted imagination, mistook her delirium for an inspiration of nature. She wanted to be a man of the state. She took of the projects of the perfidious people who want to divide France. It seems the law has punished this conspirator for having forgotten the virtues that belong to her sex. But no matter, her mistook and inspiration had already changed the world. Finally, freedom of speech included, perhaps most important of all, a woman's right to formulate and act upon her own opinion. In her final writing, written in, smuggled out from, and then published outside of prison while de Gouge was awaiting her death, Olympe de Gouge, Al Tribunal Revolutionnaire, she wrote, Does Article 7 of the Constitution not bless the freedom of expression and of the press as the most precious heritage of man? These rights, this heritage, this actual constitution, are they only vague phrases with illusory meanings? Alas, that is my sad experience. Republicans, pay attention to my words right to the end. In 1992, the Revolution Francese has proclamed this declaration of the rights of the man and of the citizen. It's the most declaration famous in the history of humanity. Allo stesso tempo, una militante rivoluzionaria, donna, che si chiamava Olimpia de Gouges, ha proposto nell'Assemblea Generale di... In the French Revolution, Pasquato proclaimed this Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen in the Declaration's most famous story of humanity. At the same time, a revolutionary militant who was called Olympe de Gouges proposed to the general public that you must also make a declaration of rights of woman and citizeness. On November 3, 1793, Olympe de Gouche was executed by guillotine. After an eventful trial in which de Gouche was afforded no lawyer, she was condemned on the account of deliberately and maliciously writing works that attacked the sovereignty of the people and was tending toward the reestablishment of the maniacal government, specifically in her work Les Trois Ernest, in which the main character Toxicodendron expresses sentiments that suggest thoughts that the situation of the French government at the time was unstable. Now is the time to establish a decent government whose energy comes from the strength of its laws. Now is the time to put a stop to assassinations and the sufferings they cause for merely holding opposing views. Let everyone examine their consciences. Let them see the incalculable harm caused by such a long-lasting division, the total upheaval of the motherland. And then everyone can pronounce freely on the government of their choice. The majority must carry the day. It is time for death to rest and for anarchy to return to the underworld. Although she died before she was able to see the true effects of her actions, only the third woman to die this way during the reign of terror, de Gouge left a lasting effect on history. Not long after her death, in 1794, slavery was abolished in the French colonies, and although it took hundreds of years and plenty of studies assessing the question of her and other French revolutionary women's sanity, she is now treated as a hero and a martyr, both titles that she fought so hard to deserve with books, movies, and much more dedicated to her.